promise. And we'll get into that with our Friday panel as well, who are standing by to get their teeth into it. Um, Atul Hawa is uh, editor of Labour Uncut, and Bill Bowker is the reporter f- uh, at Reaction. Atul, Bill, hello, good evening, good evening to you both. Thank you for being here. Good evening. Very good evening. Um, okay, listen, I'm going to start with you, Bill, on this one, because I think Atul will probably be inclined to agree with, with my conclusion, um, uh, my assessment. Um, Bill, where do you stand? You see what's happened this week. You see this play out. You see a culmination of lots and lots of moments of them, keep using this term, riding roughshod over the rules, bending the rules in their favour, ignoring the rules entirely. Is the equation that I've, or the, the conclusion that I've drawn out of that equation that Boris Johnson is a threat to society, a, a, a threat to democracy, alarmist? Am I wrong? I think it's an ex- a bit of a magnification to say that he is a threat to democracy in itself, the system, you know, in which has existed in Britain for, for hundreds of years. Um, and actually, if you looked at the, the reforms that Andrea Leadsom and other MPs were voting for and reforming the Sleaze Watchdog, there were aspects of it uh, which you could sort of agree with, one particularly being the right of appeal. The problem, though, is the timing with the Owen Patterson obviously being found guilty uh, of breaking lobbying rules. Um, and it's essentially, from the from an outsider's perspective, from a voter's perspective, it looks like um, the government also backing, you know, having to save Patterson from suspension, from essentially, you know, being a crony and, you know, being, being a sleaze. Um, and I think that's really damaging for the Conservative Party. It's damaging for Boris Johnson's leadership, who has been, as you said, accused on other occasions of being undemocratic. So as a journalist, uh, one thing that we found very frustrating, you know, working in Westminster is trying to get freedom of information requests mm. from the government mm. to, to no avail. Um, so in that sense, he's That's right. are, 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 you're finding that, are you, Bill? You're finding that, that, that it's harder now to, under this government, this current government, to get freedom of information requests out of them. Absolutely. Really? And I'm not, you know, one for particularly doing them. Uh, as much as other colleagues, but they found exactly the same the same problem as well. And there's other instances, like when Boris Johnson, you know, being found un- unconstitutional by the Supreme Court for advising the Queen uh, to prorogue Parliament mm. at, at a time where we were trying to negotiate a Brexit deal. Mm. And I, I think, I, I can't remember who it was, what which, which body it was, uh, some some European Commission on Journalism that, that found that, that this government's reluctance to talk to journalists, to be open to journalists beyond that handful of their favourites, um, is is a, a major problem, actually, is, is a major threat to democracy, I think is how they described it. Assel, um, I, I'm guessing you'll probably come, come down on, on, on the side of that. Is there anything to be said from your perspective in favour of Boris Johnson this week? I mean, is Bill right when he says that some of these, some elements at, le- at least of this amendment were... were worthy um i don't think necessarily i'd come down in any respect on boris johnson's side the one thing i would say which perhaps mitigates it's not as much that boris johnson personally has um is a threat to democracy he has exposed the fundamental weakness of our democracy we have an executive which controls the legislature unlike the united states which has a check which has checks and balances where the president and the legislature are different when the executive controls the legislature, good behaviour or good practice and social norm, the social norms we would expect are dependent on the character of the individual and their personal choice. Now, it just so happens that in the past, even with people like John Major, Theresa May, you know, David Cameron, even you know, people on the other side of the fence to me, there is a, an accepted set of behaviours. And I don't think Boris Johnson particularly conforms to that. And what that does is show that one person making a series of selfish, narcissistic, uh, vain choices can completely upend all of what we would consider to be solid and uh, constitutional. Okay, so, so, so selfish, self-centred, narcissistic, dangerous? The corollary of that is dangerous. I don't think he necessarily... So I think in the United States we see what a threat to democracy looks like. We saw that on January the 6th. We saw that with what Trump was doing. We see that what what, what Trump is doing. I don't think Boris Johnson is there in that manner. But our democracy is uniquely vulnerable to a character like that. So the things that Boris Johnson has done, he has made that sort of behaviour more acceptable, more permissible. He's moved the Overton window. And if there were a leader of the Conservative Party, or indeed you know, an extremist leader of the Labour Party, and I'm no fan, I'm no fan of Jeremy Corbyn, if there's someone who wanted, having somehow got into number 10, 
to do to ride roughshod to do whatever he wanted that's the nature of our democracy we have an accountability moment once every, once every five years and if you control the legislature there's not much that stops you no and 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 that this is a really important point in this whole conversation isn't it and 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 bill just pick up on that because because the bit that really that, that really haunts me actually from this last couple of days is the fact that there were 250 Tory <clears throat> MPs who decided to side with this this clearly wrong decision um and 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 the job of parliament and the job of parliamentarians is to sometimes be that check and balance against a central power out of number 10 that wants to do something that's clearly wrong i think that's more of a problem of the whip system uh it's, it was down on a third party whip in my opinion it shouldn't have been i think that mps should have been free to vote as they wanted and as you saw i think it was something like 100 mps that abstained um and 13 uh, had rebelled but he wouldn't he wouldn't he wouldn't have got this through would he they, they wouldn't have managed to have got this through if they hadn't done that and we're hearing some really troubling detail about some of the things that um, i mean look this is rough and tumble of politics isn't it the party the, the, the party whip's job is to get uh, their mps to support them in votes and sometimes they do things like threaten them with certain with money and they do things like uh, uh, threaten their careers and all that kind of stuff that, that that actually is kind of part of the rough and tumble of politics but surely surely there needs to be something of a backbone in at least more of those MPs to say, no, this is not the right thing to do. That may be the case. Um, and I, there were actually, there were backbench MPs who genuinely believed that the system needed reforming. Uh, people like Peter Bone, for instance, you know, part of the awkward squad, squad as he's known. Um, but, um, but I think with this, the issue I had in particular in trying to push this through the House of Commons um, is that any reform to the standards committee is going to ultimately affect everyone, not just conservative MPs, not specifically Owen Patterson. Um, so when the vote went through, one particular group that was very angry about it were um, campaigners against bullying, uh, particularly, you know, members of staff within the House of Commons who feel like they're voiceless and there needs to be a system in place um, that can act on their behalf and um, send, you know, disciplinary measures um, should a member of parliament act discourteously or um, not acted in the right manner. So as Jacob Rees attested yesterday, uh, when he did that very embarrassing U-turn, there needs to be cross-party support when something like this happens. Mm -hmm. And as you said, at the moment, there isn't that accountability because the Conservatives have an 80-seat majority, even if there was a sizable rebellion of some sort. Mm. Um, it might ultimately just go through anyway, because that's the level of support that the Conservative Party have in this country and in, in, and in Parliament. I suppose it also plays to, to the deviousness of what happened here, is that is that it should have had cross-party support. And I, 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 I'm, I was informed by my colleagues at, uh, at The Times and the Red Box mail out uh, this morning, or was it yesterday, that John Whittingdale, who'd signed up to be the chair of whatever followed and whatever came next um, had been told wrongly that there was cross-party support to, uh, to to make this happen um so i think that tells you everything you need to know about um about the way that this was carried out I, i'm also keen to get a sense from you guys as, as as to why you think it failed when we track back over all of the uh, missteps and the misdemeanors and the things that i would put down as misdemeanors or those moments where they haven't been properly held to account where ministers haven't uh, faced the consequences of their actions or even the prime minister hasn't faced the consequences of his actions they've managed to bulldoze through it's been it's been um, a minor inconvenience that they've managed to overcome this one wasn't as it transpires i'm keen to get a sense from you guys as to why you think that is atal hatwell joins us and bill bucket as well uh two journalists on the panel tonight i'd love to hear from you as well your take on this you've had a couple of days to dissect it what do you think oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand talk on your message to eight seven two double two DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. Late night with Daryl Morris on Talk Radio. Good evening. 
Um, Atul Howat joins us, and Bill Barkett as well. Both journalists, Atul from Labour List and uh, Bill from Reaction. We'd love to hear from you as well. Um, really only one story in town tonight, and that is the chaotic scenes in Parliament this week. 0344 499 1000. Jacob is in Watford. Hello, Jacob. Hi, how are we getting on, mate? All right, yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, very good. Yeah, no, I was just wanted to call just to talk about I think you're 100% right. I think what's happened is there is no political party that represents a huge section of the population. And now they're sort of getting away with murder. Everyone was more compliant with COVID than they thought. Your uh, your line's terrible, Jacob. I can't. I can barely hear what you're saying, Jacob. Can you can you get can you go to somewhere a little bit a little bit um a window maybe ideally? Yeah. So is that better? Sorry about that. Yeah. Let's give it a go. Go on. Yeah, I was just saying. I think what's happened is is they've got away with it for so long with COVID, and they're pushing and pushing the extension of the emergency powers, and it needed this sort of action to sort of grind it to a halt. Really. But it pre- but this pre this predates COVID though, doesn't it, Jacob? I mean, this 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 completely predates any it, kind it, of it, legislation it, it, around COVID, and at least with legislation around COVID they did at least need to take it through Parliament and they needed to get Parliament's approval. Now, you can debate whether or not that was the right thing to do or not, Jacob, but but so it, it this kind of behaviour predates it. It, it does, but it's also the fact that this is what... They, they did it in the Parliament most recently, and I think people sort of had enough. The attention has been drawn to it now that there is this sort of elite club where they feel they can do what they want. Um, and I think people are just quite sick of it now. OK, Atul, pick up on that point. Um, I think that... The... There is an arrogance that comes from getting away with it. So Barnard Castle got away with it. Proroguing Parliament got away with it, won an election. Um, the Prime Minister's wallpaper got away with it. And it's just like with kids, if you, and indeed adults, if you get away with something, you try it on again and again and again. And I don't think it's necessarily related to um, the emergency powers um, around COVID. It's about people's behaviour. And the fact that if there are no consequences, then you keep on doing it. Now, one of the things I think that's interesting in this case, there are some consequences. There's a very angry Conservative Party. There's an absolute fuming Labour Party. And there are angry constituents. Um, And the the thing that swung it ultimately would have been the inboxes of Conservative MPs, where this isn't just a Westminster bubble issue, because that was the spin immediately afterwards and immediately before it. This is just going to be a Westminster bubble issue. Uh, and the fact that it isn't, and it cut through, and actually the overnight polling had a three-point drop in the Conservative lead, says ultimately that, I mean, that's actually the one sanction, the one limit on a government's behaviour, because whilst they would try to get away with it, there's no one as nervous about polls as politicians. Public opinion, for sure. Jacob, just on the, on the point about the COVID measures, and, and listen, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, I do. I, I understand why you've made the conclusion that you've made. I wonder if the difference is... The things that, that that you would want to do, if you were a leader who felt that sense of arrogance and you felt that you could do whatever you wanted to do, and let's not forget that Boris Johnson made a speech in which he advocated keeping things open, right? Mm-hmm. The difference, surely, is that Boris Johnson didn't particularly want, perhaps, to put the country into lockdown. He didn't want to implement these emergency pa- powers. But when it's about proroguing Parliament to get something done, they wanted to do it. When it comes to dismantling the Standards Committee, they wanted to do it. When it comes to protecting Priti Patel or Robert Jenrick or Dominic Cummins, it's something that they clearly wanted to do. There was an intent there, wasn't there? Oh, oh we've had a doubt. We've had a doubt. OK. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, just, I, I, th- I feel that, for me, feels like that's the difference, though, right? That's the difference between those two things. No, yeah, yes or no. I think this is the one way he's really been caught out. I think the other ones had the guise of it of it being under COVID things. People are a lot more accepting. Um, I think that people are now starting to get a bit of perspective again, going back to sort of real life. He's got away with the fact that there is no opposition to him, really, that La- Labour has done nothing, and there is no sort of party which would challenge him on it. And I think that now it's just become the gentleman's club, and they're just pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And every time someone bites back, he does a U-turn. And I think he's just been caught out. He's, he's overstepped the mark. He's, he's not... Um, gauge the public at all, and, and, and finally it's it sort of come to light. OK, David to Newcastle. Hi, David. Hello there, how are you? What are you thinking? Well, I tweeted about a year ago on Facebook and everything uh, that Boris would disappear like Matt Hancock and um, all the rest of them, uh, sort of just backing up this COVID sort of stuff. And I'm just listening here about getting away with it. i tell you what, you know what's going to happen? Right, nobody's going to get away with it because what's happened over the last two years is literally genocide. And, and what do you, well, let's let's hang on a minute, David. Hang on, hang on. Hold, David. All the doctors, 
Everyone. Yeah, no, David, David, it, it, that, that, when, I, when I talked earlier about being alarmist and uh, trading in hyperbole and being conscious of not wanting yeah. to do that, mm-hmm. that is what you've just done. That is a, that is a, a very alarmist uh, piece of hyperbole. But give us a sense, da- David, of what you mean by the Matt Hancock thing. What right, do you I mean about he'll disappear I... like Matt Hancock? What does that mean? Well, can I, can, would, I mean, would you give us a couple of minutes, just one minute to speak? Right. Well, it depends I'm what you say, David, but go on, we'll I'm, give it a go. <laughs> yeah, I'm self-employed, yeah. Actually, I was quite prepared for the pandemic. I'm, I'm like a, one of these so-called nuthouse preppers, right? But uh, it was a long story. Right. At the start of the pandemic, masks were useless for two or three months, yeah? There was then the let-in flights from all over the world, from China, from India. This whole thing has been an absolute shambles. It, 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 okay, David, but the, 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 David, the that, 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 uh, David, listen, listen, I, I understand, I understand. And you, you, the, 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 there are perhaps, there are, there are links and points to be made around track and trace for sure and contracts for PPE, etc. That all yeah. kind of makes sense because you could, you could, you could, you could file that in the bracket alongside other shady moves that seem to benefit them more than their, the people that they purport to serve. The problem, though, David, is that we're talking here about intent, right? Those, those, those issues that you talk about with COVID are clearly missteps and botch jobs, but that's different, isn't it, to, to, to ramming through a change of the rules in the way that they did on Wednesday night. Um, and, and also, and also, David, sorry, just more to the point, David, give us your Matt Hancock comparison. What do, you, what do you mean specifically when you say that Boris Johnson will disappear like Matt Hancock? What does that mean? Because they're all, like, sort of liable... Uh, for what's happened. I mean, uh, there was me and my dog, right? Me and my dog from the start of the pandemic till now. We've travelled the north of England, yes? I'm self-employed. I'd never had no help, no support, nothing from no one, right? Right. And do you know what it is? When I hear all this, like, civilities and all these words, and it's just a little... You know, no, it's not. This is real people's lives. I was travelling through, you know... But with David, with David, with David you, seem to be, you, seem to be, you seem to be engaged in, in a debate that we're not having around COVID restrictions there, I think. Let me let me just bring in um, Bill, though, on that, because you're nodding along, Bill. And I wonder, listen, I, I don't I don't agree necessarily on, on the issue of COVID restrictions. I, 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 think, I think I'm able to see the difference between what was something that they didn't want to do, an, an unpleasant necessity that clearly they didn't want to do, um, but, but felt they needed to anyway, and something that they don't need to do, but have done in their own self-interest. Um, in the public's mind, Bill, is there a is there a conflation of the two that sort of builds up this sense that they're not on our side? Or, or actually, I mean, actually, let me let me rephrase that question slightly, because the majority of people, if polling is to believed, if polling is to be believed, the majority of people are relatively comfortable with the the restrictions. Indeed, were supportive of them, and therefore there's a conflict there, right? I mean, is that empowered mm-hmm. Boris Johnson to believe that he can get away with other things? That certainly is the case. I think there's two important points, actually, which Jacob and David are saying, if I could synthesise it in many ways, is that with with Jacob, when it comes to the Coronavirus Act itself, at the start, it was acute. It made perfect sense. The government didn't necessarily want to lock down the country, but it had to to protect lives in order to you know, reduce transmission. But the current six-month extension, the latest six-month extension, could almost be seen as an undemocratic measure in which many MPs, including Labour MPs and Conservative MPs, feel that they have no ability over because they they aren't able to scrutinise, you know, if there was introducing of a mask mandate. But we we still we still we still get caught, though, don't we, Bill, in that in that intent thing in what they want to do versus what they feel that they have to do if we're to if we're to conclude that boris johnson feels like he has to but clearly doesn't want to implement lockdown measures or any kind of measures given that he is a libertarian frankly right and 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 gave a speech to that effect at the start of the pandemic but felt like he had to as a necessity to protect public health that surely isn't the same thing as ramming through a rule change because it's an inconvenience totally but then that links then to to david's case and that it was, even though it's necessary, and I completely agree with you, um, I think it will bite the Conservatives at the next election. I think it's pretty obvious if you have a majority, you know, of 80, and now you have a more competent leader in Keir Starmer, and frankly, Boris Johnson hasn't shown his best light 
uh, in office at all. Um, I feel like the actions of the Conservative Party during the coronavirus pandemic add to that, you know, accusations of, you know, acting in an undemocratic manner when it comes to, you know, accountability right. or when it and comes contracts to and PPE the standards. And I think that, we, we've that's still got the te- case. Te- testing, yeah, okay. And the investigation into test and trace is still to come out in the wash and, and uh, the PPE stuff and there will be a, 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 the, a, a um, big inquiry, inquiry into, well. for sure, absolutely. Yeah, okay, that, 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 that I suppose then makes a, an element of sense. Um, Atul, stay there, and Bill as well. Atul Hatwat is with us from uh, Labourlist and Bill uh, Bagkit as well from Reaction on the Friday panel. Some other bits and bobs. By God, 45 minutes, we've only got into one topic so far. We'll talk about COP after this. Stay there. We're going to roll out a classic of the genre before 11 o'clock. I can't let the 5th of November pass us by without asking if fireworks should be banned. Can we? Come on, man. I can't let that one go by. It's like a it's like it's a dead cert. It's like a spag ball. If in doubt, bring it out. Uh, we'll get into that before 11 o'clock. Um, Atul Hatwell joins us, editor of Labour List. And, uh, and Bill Burkett as well, who is a reporter at Reaction on the Friday panel. We'll, we'll get into that really pressing, cutting issue uh, before 11, chaps, I promise. Let's talk about COP, though, first, shall we? Uh, leaders have gathered in Glasgow. Um, the, the vast majority of the big sort of pomp and ceremony seems to be largely done. The conference continues, though, for another week of, um, of haggling and negotiations and some of the big details over those big swathes and promises that seem to have been made. Um, I wonder, if I wonder uh, Atul, if we weren't talking about the chaos in Parliament, we'd be talking about a, relati- a relatively successful week for Boris Johnson and team at COP26. Can it be regarded as something that um, that they can celebrate, do you think? Within political terms, it's hard to call it a success because if you had to write a story about COP, what would be your top line? I can't think of one. You, there's, a, there's something about deforestation earlier this week that got unpicked by um, the Indonesian mm. um, government uh, and various other governments around um, accountability and, and practicality. And what's been the other top line? I think there, are, there is there's a case you can be made that on the path to net zero and sustainability, it's a it's a it's a gateway. It's a sort of waypoint where things have accelerated and people have done their homework to get ready for it. But what's the big announcement? And I contrast that with the G7, where uh, and the last G and the G20 a couple of weeks ago, where in both cases, the big takeaway was this global agreement on a 15 percent corporation tax. That's a huge thing, huge global change. Um, and there's just no top line coming out of COP26. Mm. And that's why in the absence of the top line, you get uh, all the headlines taken up with Greta, all the headlines taken up with um, some stories about accessibility and this and that. And it, I, I, the government just didn't. Neither did they set a narrative nor have they controlled the narrative. Mm. So whilst there may be good stuff happening behind the scenes, I, within political and media terms, it's hard to see what, you know, what was the, what's the story you'd write? Okay, that's really interesting. Bill, just pick up on that. And and just to just to um, fill in the gap on Greta, Greta Thunberg has refer, referred to COP26 as being a, a greenwashing exercise. She's been very critical of it, actually, hasn't she? Uh, at a mm. march in, um, in Glasgow. And, and, and that certainly won't read particularly well for those people who will regard themselves as being on the same side as Greta Thunberg. Um, well, where's your head at, Bill, on this when you, when you look back over the last week or so? A success or not? In many ways, I'm kind of inclined to agree with Greta um, in that all the major foreign leaders, Joe Biden, Boris Johnson um, and others were only there for about three days in total for the entire two week conference. Um, and um, and I think that while there has been some progress, particularly when it comes to deforestation and also when it comes to coal, it has been lacking in, in so many different areas. So India, for instance, you know, announcing its net zero strategy, but not until 2070. Um, and you have, you know, the United Nations says we have nine years to prevent the irreversible damage done by by climate change. Uh, and, and like Atul said, I think the the main dog, there hasn't been a main overarching message or headline only being these minor PR cop flops, as I like to call them, when it comes to rats in the streets of Glasgow uh, and Greta, you know, you know, shouting outside of, you know, the conference centre itself um, and, and, and issues around accessibility, Biden sleeping through people's speeches. I think those sorts of things are really hitting into people. And, you know, as, as a journalist myself, particularly as a diarist, I like to revel in these sorts of things. But, um, yeah, but I do think it depends on the voters, even if they think um, it's the environmental message and they believe that it needs addressing. I just don't think it's going to 
counterfactually be the same as a Copenhagen or a Paris in terms of its overall impact. Yeah, certainly not Paris. I mean, Paris was a, a landmark moment, wasn't it, in terms of a, an agreement and a headline figure and everybody on the same page. It certainly felt like a massive, massive moment. I wonder, I wonder though, it's, it's an interesting point you made, Bill, and I, I wonder, I wonder, Atal, if, if it's really more about tone, this, in as much as, you know, there's, I mean, there are a couple of headline grabbing, um, uh, uh, um, moments you know india uh, a commitment on methane a commitment on trees you know various things but as you say perhaps nothing that sort of packs a punch like paris but we had david attenborough making a speech we had uh you know prince charles love him or loathe him um everybody on the rel on a relatively similar page world leaders having the you know talking with one voice in a way that they haven't for such a long time and that in itself in terms of setting the tone for the ongoing conversations around climate change has been a success so I'd, I'd say that the success is probably, it's actually probably less to do with the governments, though it's led by the governments. If there is a success, it's not a media or political success. It's more in the change you one sees in um, industry. So businesses all have sustainability plans. They all now have, are putting money behind those plans. There was a whole kind of to do about finance day where about kind of sustainable finance and only financing sustainable projects. And there's a kind of, you know, there's some, there's some chaff around, you know, there's an oil field here or a coal mine there. But fundamentally, the culture change within industry and business where money is put behind reformulating processes, reformulating products uh, and delivering against a target, that has been catalyzed to an extent by COP26. And it's, and it, it's not amenable to an immediate headline, mm. but I think that it, there is good that comes out of it. But the question is, did it take a big thing in Glasgow with leaders there for 10 minutes a piece, you know, to, to, to achieve that? Or was that, that actually going to happen anyway? But that's real life, though, isn't it? I mean, that, that's exactly how these things work. You have two days of all the big headline speakers and then two weeks of the actual nitty gritty of the, the people underneath them getting to work and doing the uh, uh, and doing the detail. I suppose that's to be expected. We'll talk more about that after 11, by the way. I'm going to be joined by some people who are in Glasgow at COP26. We'll get a, a closer look at that story after 11. Um, I can't not get to this, boys, though, before... Uh, we wrap up and um, I'm going to roll out a classic of the genre. I hope you will allow. Uh, it is bonfire night tonight. You might still be able to hear. I mean, if you're setting off fireworks right now, you are frankly antisocial. Uh, we've got about two minutes uh, on this, a minute apiece. Atul, is it time to ban fireworks from public sale? Um, probably. Um, I say that reluctantly because I always loved fireworks at home and all the rest of it where, as a kid. But it's probably not a good idea to have loads of explosives. And as someone I saw tweeting earlier, Basically, you buy them from a news agent, you wouldn't trust to sell you an in-date pack of crisps. So, uh, <laughs> license displays. <laughs> That's going to be a fair point. Um, uh, Bill, what do you think? Uh, no, I don't think uh, fireworks should be banned. I think uh, people should have the freedom otherwise. But obviously, to be responsible, I think the best times to go is to go to one of these ticketed events, you know, be with friends and family, you know, get a pint or, like get some bovril or some, some something like that and just Park have a good time, you know, marvelling. But I've never really been a fan of um, Bonfire Night or Guy Fawkes Night, whatever you want to call it, just because, you know, when I was a kid being autistic, you know, I just hated the noise and I'd never attend them, even though I was forced to have to wear headphones to mediate the sound. Uh, uh, but now yeah. having grown up in the world of work, it's just... It's just a nuisance and um you know my dog and cat are petrified we had to put on classic fm you know mm. that they had a special show on this evening to help yeah, calm them down we did that as well um and there's obviously other like hedgehogs and public damage but no i don't think it should be uh they, they, they shouldn't be banned i hear you i hear you and i just i'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to resist this because i don't know if it's just sort of a grumpy old man coming out of me but there's there's nothing worse is there than sort of sitting relaxing on your couch of an evening and hearing bah, 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 bang, bang, bang outside the window it's horrible it's horrible for everybody other than the people who are stood there and i could i could probably guarantee that half of them aren't particularly interested in being there uh, either to watch them in person uh, bill atul really nice to talk to you both thank you so much for being with us on the panel tonight really appreciate it Atul hatwa uh, from labor and cut and uh bill burkett as well from reaction okay <laughs>